Uh, the title of my sermon is, and we'll come back uh, to that passage in uh, 1 Thessalonians 2, uh, as we saw there in uh, verse 11 and verse 12, as you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children, that you would walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. So uh, no surprise that today is Father's Day. So happy Father's Day to all of you who are fathers. Uh, today I want to preach on attributes of a godly father. And being a godly father really is no different to being a godly man. So I just wanted to give five attributes of a godly father and encourage uh, the men here today to seek that standard and to live to the standards that God has put in the Bible. Now, what is the world's idea of manliness? If you think about it for a bit, maybe you had wrong ideas in the past of what it meant to be a man. But if you think about what is the world's idea of manliness, you know, maybe you'll get the picture of a man who is a fornicator. What does that mean? Somebody that has sex outside, or, you know, sex in the wrong situation, outside of marriage, right? Whether it's adultery or whether it's fornication. You may get that sort of image. You know, maybe when you were growing up in high school, you're growing up in university. Man, the guys that were the really good men, man, they, were, they were the guys getting all the chicks, right? So you may think, oh, that's, that's the world's idea of manliness, a whoremonger or a fornicator. Or you might think of a guy who's a brawler, I mean, nowadays with, you know, people's morals and standards just dropping, you see the sports stars these days, you see the fighters these days, they're just a bunch of brawlers, aren't they? They're not only fighting the ring, or they, you know, they're out trying to prove how tough they are, going this party, that party, getting into fights. Is that what God wants for men of God, to be a brawler, to be a tough person, to threaten? I mean, sometimes you see men of God say things like that. They kind of try and act all tough, saying, oh, you know, I'll sock you one in the face and say things like that. And it's, that, that's no place for a man of God to, to be violent, right? To be a brawler. Or what about a drunkard? Maybe the world classifies, man, that guy can just drink so much. Oh, look, he's drinking all the time. He drinks this and drinks that. He can really hold his liquor, you know, and then they get drunk. Is that what God considers manliness, or that's what the world considers manliness, maybe a drunken. What about somebody that's a filthy communicator? What does that mean? Somebody that has filthy communication coming out of their mouth. Nowadays, you know, people that are seen as manly in the world, F this, F that, S this, F that, all oh, that M, F for this. Is that how men of God ought to talk? No, that's not how we should talk, right? But that's what the world considers manly. So you're going to consider these things. What does the world consider manliness? What is their idea of manliness? And you know what? God's idea of manliness is the fact opposite. What about a man that's unwise with his money? You think of the guys growing up, oh man, oh, he's got the latest car, he's got the latest gadget. A lot of time, men are just going into debt buying those things. And they're unwise with their funds, spending all the money that they're making when they're growing up and then, you know, they're single and making a lot of money. Is that what is manliness? You know, men just spending money on fast cars, fast bikes, expensive clothes. Hey, look at how manly that guy is. He's always shouting people dinner. He's always shouting people things. Why is he being so unwise with his money? He's making all this money now. He's not sure how to be a saver. So what does God consider as manliness? Usually it's the, in fact, it's the absolute opposite. Let's look at a charge that David gave to King Solomon and his, as his son in 1 Kings 2. Now the days of David drew nigh that he should die, and he charged Solomon his son, saying, I go the way of all the earth, be thou strong therefore, and show thyself a man. How is he going to show himself a man? Look at what he says to Solomon. He says, and keep the charge of the Lord by God. You see, a man who's a drunkard, a brawler, a whoremonger, he's not wise with his money, has filthy communication. In the eyes of God, he's not showing himself a man. Why? Because he's not keeping the charge of the Lord thy God. Look, to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes and his commandments and his judgments and his testimonies. 
as it is written, right? So it's not just your idea of how to serve God. No, it's as it is written in the law of Moses, that thou mayest prosper in all that thou doest, and whithersoever thou turnest thyself. So beauty fades really quickly. If you think about it with a lady, beauty fades really quickly if there's no godliness behind that beauty, right? And men, you know what? What, what should be attractive about a man, you know, or what the world finds attractive about a man, that fades very quickly when you marry a man that is ungodly. So it's the same you know, with women, you know, you marry somebody just because they're, they're beautiful, they have no character, they have no godliness, you know why that fades really quickly? And you know, ladies, all that stuff that the world considers manly, that fades very quickly if there is no character or godliness behind that person. So we're going to talk about five attributes of a godly father. Now the first one is behavior. Behavior. Let's look at what it says here in Deuteronomy 22. And we looked at this uh, um, not long ago. Deuteronomy 22, The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. So first of all, one attribute of a godly man is that he looks manly. So men shouldn't be dressing feminine, you know, thinking about those sort of things, thinking about, you know, making their hair all fancy, colouring their hair, you know, wearing all sorts of jewellery and fancy clothes that are bright and shiny. If men are doing that sort of stuff, that's very feminine. It's a very feminine attribute. Now look at what it says in 1 Timothy 2. So first of all, we saw in Deuteronomy 22 that we obviously shouldn't be wearing things that are for women. And uh, that line is being very blurred today, where, you know, the, the fancy men's clothes, like if you go to a men's clothing store, sometimes it's just as fancy as the women's clothing store. So don't, it, one godly attribute of a godly father is that not only does he act and talk like a man, but he also dresses like a man. You look like a man. You act manly. Look what it says in 1 Timothy 2. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly array. Now you say, Victor, why are you reading this passage? This passage is women. You're preaching on being a godly father today. And that's my point. My point is this passage, which is the passage in the Bible that exhorts people to dress modestly, is directed at women. Because the assumption is a godly man is not doing these things. So he doesn't need to be told, dress in modest apparel, don't wear costly array, don't, care, don't have broided hair and coloured hair. It's directed at women because a man doesn't do those things. That's why it's not directed at men. So you should ought to take that to heart. Like Men ought to take that to heart to think, you know, why am I so concerned with looking pretty if I'm a man? Now in 1 Corinthians 6, look what it says here. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, look at this, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So I just wanted to point out this verse because what, is it, what does it mean to be effeminate? See, to be feminine is when you're a lady and you act like a lady. But to be effeminate is when you're a man and you act like a lady, right? And that's actually a sin in the Bible. It's a sin for a man to be effeminate. And that's why we should strive to be manly and masculine in our behavior as well as men. Look what here, not only in our behavior, in our speech, in our appearance, the Bible also talks about the length of our hair as well. Doth not even nature itself teach you that, that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory for her to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. So see how God wants there to be a difference between men and women. He wants there to be a difference in how they look, in how they speak, in how they act, and how they, um, how they dress. So one attribute, like I said, of a godly father is that we set that example 
to be manly in our behavior. Number two, what's another attribute of a godly father? Is that he is faithful. What is, and what is faith? What, what, what idea do you get when a man is faithful? It means he does what he needs to do without being supervised, right? He's faithful. Let's have a look at a couple of passages here. Look at Proverbs 31. This is about the virtuous woman. Look what it says here. Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. So you know, it's very rare to find a virtuous woman. And really like virtuous, faithful, like basically somebody who's doing what they should be doing. Like somebody who is a virtue, that's good. But it is rare, isn't it? And it's rare to find people that are serving God and that are faithful in serving God. Not just amongst men, but amongst women. Not just amongst Christianity in general, but even amongst fundamental Bible-believing Christians that know the truth, that ought to know better. It's rare to find as well. It's rare to find a faithful woman, a virtuous woman. But you know what the Bible says? The Bible says the same thing about men. Look at what it says here in Proverbs 20. Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man, who can find? Isn't it interesting that it uses the same sort of phraseology? Who can find a virtuous woman? Right? It's quite difficult to find. It says here, look, but a faithful man, who can find? But what I find funny about this passage is most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness. Isn't that true? Like most men talk about how great they are, right? And all the things that they do. But it says a faithful man who can find because the one that actually lives up to the hype that he gives himself is rare to find. So not only is it rare to find a virtuous woman, it's rare to find a faithful man. But that's what we ought to strive for as men. We have to try and be faithful. So when we think of faithfulness, I mean, who, who, what, well, there's one character in the Bible I think of when I think of faithfulness, and that's Moses. And he's commented on in Hebrews 3, where it says here, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who's, who was faithful to him that appointed him. So this is talking about Christ being faithful to the Father, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. So why is Moses also called faithful? Because when you read through Exodus and you read through the Old Testament, how many times do you hear that phrase, as the Lord commanded Moses? He did as the Lord commanded Moses. That's why Moses was faithful. What does it mean to be faithful? It means you're doing what you should be doing, what you've been commanded to do of God, and he did it without supervision, right? He did it without being told. Let's look at Matthew 25. Matthew 25 is the parable of the talents. And look at what it says here. We are not going to read the whole parable, but remember after the parable, the talents were given out and they're coming back to, to report back to the master. It says, after a long time. So note that. After a long time, the master's been away. The master's given them responsibilities to do, just like today. Jesus has gone away. He's given you as fathers, us as parents as well, responsibilities and things to do are you being faithful after a long time the lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them and so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents saying lord thou deliverest unto me five talents so remember the delivering of the five talents something to do some responsibilities to have for a long time and behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. So you see that they're good and they're faithful because they kept doing what they ought to be doing. Thou hast been faithful over a few things, I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. The same happens to the one that received two talents. He also that received two talents came and said, Lord, Thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. And I won't read the rest of the parable. We know the one servant that didn't do anything was cast out into outer darkness. There was weeping and gnashing of teeth. Just make sure you don't misunderstand that these are parables. They have many different meanings. So we don't apply salvation to these parables 
in, in the way that doing good works, because we know salvation is not by works. We understand that righteousness that we have in order to earn salvation is by, our, uh, by grace through faith. Uh, so you have to kind of be careful sometimes with these parables. That's not what I'm preaching about today. That's why I'm just showing you that part of the parable. I just want to talk about faithfulness as a servant of God. Luke 19 is the same when we look at the parable of the 10 pounds, very similar. But it says here, And he called his 10 servants and delivered them 10 pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. So what does it mean to occupy? It means to get busy, get busy working, doing the things you ought to be doing. And that's what we should be doing while the master is not here. So it's the same when your master's not here. It's the same if I'm not around. It's the same if your boss is not around. You ought to be faithful. Right? Be a faithful worker and do what you should be doing without being told. So you don't need supervision. You have some initiative. You are proactive in what you need to do. And you know what? The Bible teaches that if you look after the small things that you are responsible for, then you will be rewarded with bigger things to look after. And it doesn't only work like that in heaven. Yes, in heaven, we're given things by God to look after. And if we're faithful with them, God's going to reward us. But this same principle applies in life. Look what it says here in Luke 16. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. So you don't want to have the attitude of, man, I, I, these little things are unimportant. I just need to focus on the big things. Why can't I just look after the big things? Because well, you know what? If you can't take care of the small things properly, you can't be entrusted with those small things, who doesn't put you in charge of something bigger? If therefore you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? So what is Jesus teaching here? If you haven't even been faithful in the stuff on earth, right? The unrighteous man. When God gives you resources and you squander them, you spend them on, your, on yourself, why would God put you in charge of things in heaven? Why would he commit to your trust the true riches when you have not been found faithful? And, he have, and if you have not been, found, been faithful in that which is another's, if you, if, and if ye have not been found being faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? So this principle applies not only to spiritual and heavenly things, but if you internalize this principle in your day-to-day -day life, whenever you're given a task at work, whenever, you know, kids, whenever mom and dad give you a task and you go about it, or in church, like I ask you to do something and you do it, you do it well, you do it unsupervised, you do it properly, then you will be entrusted with greater things to do. Why? Because when you look after the small things, then people will uh, you know, commit to your trust, the true riches, the things that are even more important. All right, let's go to number three. So act like a man. You need to be faithful. You need to be a hard worker. If you want to be a godly father, you have to work hard. You have to do the best in everything that you do and be a hard worker. Look at what it says in 2 Thessalonians 3. This is a strong rebuke to people that are lazy, that do not work. And we're not talking about people that are disabled and people that are obviously struggling to make ends meet. These are people that are trying to make ends meet and they're not, you know, people that, there are people that are trying to make ends meet and they're not able to. And there are people that are able-bodied and are just not even trying. If they're just like asking for help and mooching off the church, this is what this verse is talking about. 2 Thessalonians 3, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly. And we'll find out what that walking disorderly is about as we read through the passage. And not after the tradition which ye have received of us. For yourselves know how you ought to follow us. For we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. So Paul is saying, hey, see, when we were among you, we weren't lazy. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Now, a lot of people use this passage to sort of try and prove that you know, uh, people, leaders in church shouldn't get paid and you know, not even Paul got paid. Well, Paul did get paid. So the question is, why is he saying this? Well, because sometimes Paul would forego the power that he had to receive wages from the church to set an example, to say, look, this is how you can work hard and work for your money. It's not that he, that's what he always did. Look, not because we have not power, 
So you see how he has authority to do that, and he did use that authority in some churches where he took wages from them, and he didn't work just you know, making tents and whatnot. But here he's, trying to, he's, he's with the Thessalonians, and he's trying to set an example to show, hey, look, this is how you can work. Right? This is how you can work and serve God at the same time, and this is how you ought to be living. Not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. So what is he referring to? Because back then, obviously, a larger part of church was providing food for people, the daily ministration. And he's saying if there's somebody that's just lazy, that can work and earn a living, and they're not, they should be not allowed to eat. You know, they should have to work to set an example to other people that you can't just walk disorderly amongst the church and then just be fed. So there's a punishment there. Neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man, and have no company with him. So you see how it's interesting that laziness with men is such a big deal that this will get you excommunicated. This is one of the things that will get you excommunicated, along with you know, fornication and extortion and these other things. A man that is not willing to work and earn a living, you know, provide for his, family, provide for his own house, and he's able to, is something that is worthy of excommunication. That he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. So it's not done out of hatred, it's done in love. You want that man to get right so that he'll be driven to actually go about and do something and suffer that shame in not doing it. Look what the Bible says in 1 Timothy 5. See, this is why we got to work hard. we got to work hard so we can provide for our families and we can provide for the, also for the things of God as well. We need to be men that actually get to work and do things and be productive members of society. First Timothy 5. But if any provide not for his own, look at this, especially for those of his own house, he is denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. You see, a man that will not work to provide for his house, the Bible is saying, hey, you're worse than the unbelievers. Because even unbelievers go out there and work to provide for their family and for their children. But he's saying here, man, you've denied the faith. So you denied because there's, there's, the, there's the faith to get saved, but there's also the living by faith. So you can deny the faith, not saying, hey, you're rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ and his gift and his sacrifice. It's saying you're rejecting what it means to live by faith and following God and following his commandments. He's denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. So we've got to be a hard worker. So we act like a man. We need to be faithful in what we do. We need to be a hard worker. Number four is you need to be a leader. You need to be a leader. And what does it mean to be a leader? It means you have to be in front. It means you have to do things to a greater degree. That's what it means to be a leader. <coughs> Genesis 3. God has ordained man to be the leader. And I know this is not popular in the world today, but this is how it is. This is not only how God ordained it, this is best for the family because women are more easily deceived as we read in the Bible. Men are accountable to God. Men are the stronger leaders. They need to rise to that occasion. And may, you know, are there some women out there that are not e easily deceived? Yeah, of course. Are there some women out there that you know, may be a better leader than some men? Yeah, of course. But the reason why we need to set that example, even if you are, you may be a wife that's you know, smarter than your husband, a better leader than your husband, but why? You get behind your husband to set the example because overall in the society, men are made to lead and this is how society should function and it functions best when men are in charge. So even women who may be strong, they need to realize that and go, you know what? It's not just about my personal situation. I can do things better. It's about setting, you know, if you're so strong as a woman, set the example for the next generation. You say, you know what? I could lead this family. I could do a better job than my husband, maybe. But you know what? I'm going to follow God and do what God wants me to do because God knows what's best for my family, what's best for the church, what's best for society. I'm going to set the example of how it is, how, what it means to be a submissive and an obedient wife. 
And the same with men. Don't just let your wife lead. You know, she wants to lead. You've got to step up. You've got to make sure that you're being the leader in your family. You're leading that family and going in front of your family, doing things first, doing things better, so that you make sure that you're in charge. Genesis 3. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband. Look at this. And he shall rule over thee. So from the very beginning in Genesis 3, God sets how he wants the family to be run. And the man is the one that to, to be the, the ruler of his house. Not only to rule over his wife, but to rule over his children. Now obviously when we hear the word rule, we always think of like an oppressive ruler. But no, just because you're in charge, that doesn't mean you should be ruling oppressively, right? There's a right way to rule and a wrong way to rule. Jesus is our ruler. He's in charge. We submit to him. But is he an oppressive ruler? Does he not love us? Does he not provide for us and care for us? So when we think about the sort of ruler, ruler and leader we ought to be, we need to think of the example set by the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 2, not only in family, but also in church. Let the women learn in silence with all subjection. See, this is why we don't have women preachers. This church is not the building. Now, the church is not just also when we're around. This is the church now when we're assembled and we're at attention. This is what I believe about what this passage is talking about. And this is why men, only men should address the congregation. This is how God has them in authority. Let the women learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. See, that's the danger of having a woman preacher. Because women are more deceived. They buy into the philosophy. They're more, you know, because they're more emotional as well, they buy into all this, you know, all the pulling of the heartstrings, oh, poor homosexuals and poor this, poor, all oh, these women in crisis, you know, that's why you have to have an abortion and all this sort of stuff. So they can't just cut through to the facts and just think about what is actually true. You know what I mean? And I'm not saying all women. I'm just saying they struggle. They, they would struggle more with these things. That's why God doesn't have them teaching the church because they're more inclined to get carried away with these things. Ephesians 5, not only in the church, but also in the family. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife. So you see here, God has an order in the family that husbands should be at the head. So you men, you need to act like the head. You need to take charge and be the leader in your family. Even as Christ is the head of the church and he is the saviour of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. And the last one, 1 Corinthians 11. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is the man and the head of Christ is God. So a very clear structure that we have in the family and men need to rise to that occasion. Now, how are you going to be a good leader in your family? The way you're a good leader is you need to be a good follower. See, a good leader is a good follower first. Why? Because ultimately, we lead our families by following the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you're not following Jesus and you're not doing what you ought to be doing as a good Christian, then you're not leading your family right. 1 Corinthians 11. Be followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. So you want to be a leader. What does it mean to be a leader again? That you're in front. So if your wife is more passionate about going to church than you are, you're not leading your family. You know, if your wife knows more Bible than you, you're not leading your family. If your wife is trying to push you to go soul winning, you're not leading your family. You know what I mean, you've got to rise up to be a leader. And it means you do things first. It means you're in front. You know, I've always heard this saying, you know, pioneers take the most arrows, but they get the biggest plot of land. It's not always easy being in front. But you know, you're going to be rewarded for it. And oftentimes people will ask me, you know, like, how do I get people to follow me? How do I get my wife to follow me? My wife won't do what I say. My wife won't submit to me. 
Well, you know how you get people to follow you? You need to be somebody worth following. That's one way. So if you're struggling to get your wife to support you, to get your wife behind you, to get your wife on board with what you want to do, maybe you need to rise up to the occasion. Be somebody worth following, and that's going to make it easier for her to obey God and follow you. Let's talk about the last one. Okay, so we need to be a man, faithful, hard worker. You want to be a leader, which means you're in front. You do things first, you're more passionate. And the last one I want to touch on is being a father. You know, a godly attribute of a godly father is to father your children. Now, when it comes to Father's Day and Mother's Day, one thing I don't really like about Father's Day and Mother's Day is I don't think people should be commended just for being a father. I don't think people should be commended just for being a mother. Because you know what? It's really easy to just be a mother physically. You need to have children. People fornicate and they have children. People are parents and they're not good parents. Right? So what we want to think about on Father's Day is, you know, it's not just commend. I don't think it should be about commending people <laughs> to, for, for just being a father. But really it should be a reminder of us to be a good father. You know, and to remember the responsibilities we have as fathers, as mothers, and rise to that occasion of what God has called us to be. So God obviously has instructions in the Bible directed at fathers. And you may not have maybe thought about this before, but often a lot of the verses we use and we talk about raising our children are specifically directed at fathers. Look at this. Ephesians 6. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now you've probably thought about this verse before and just thought, and just probably in your mind, you've just generalized it as parents ought to raise their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And that's right. But isn't it interesting that the charge is not parents raise your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. It's not mothers provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. But no, it says, and ye fathers... Ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now we can speculate on why maybe God has it that way. Is it maybe because men have a tendency to take a back seat when it comes to the rearing of their children? That's what we see. I mean, if you think of the stereotypical Western dad, you know, who's working, got his hobbies, you know, mom is raising the children, teaching the children, has the children in order. Dad it comes home, has no idea, doesn't talk to the kids. Sometimes he's just at work all the time, right? Workaholic. Come from one work, glued to the TV screen. Goes to sleep, goes to work. And then before you know it, he's not pay taking part in raising his children. And that's why the exhortation is there. As a father, make sure you are involved in the training of your children. Yeah, you're not going to be there because you have to go out and work. I understand that. But you have to purpose in your heart to be involved in the lives of your children. You know, make sure you don't just go home, sit on the couch, watch the TV. You need to spend some time with your children. Talk with them. Take them out. You know, like sometimes when I go to the shops, I might take one of my sons with me. It just gives me some quality time with them. But I make sure I talk to them. I make sure I teach them. Elizabeth is not the only one teaching my children things in the house. I teach them things as well. And when I have an opportunity to teach them things, I explain things to them. And I like having that opportunity. I teach them things when I'm driving with them in the car, or I'm going with them in places. I'm involved in that teaching. I don't just leave it to my wife. I'm also involved in the discipline. Right? I'm involved in the things of my children's life because it's not just my wife's responsibility to bring up my children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. The, the exhortation and the charge is to me first and foremost as the father in my family. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Here's the parallel passage in Colossians 3. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be 
discourage, right? We don't want to discourage our children. We want to encourage them. So we want to show them love, nurture and admonition. We, we want to encourage our children. And we also want to be involved in the discipline. Look here. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us. So in your families, guys, is mom the only one disciplining the children? Is mom the only one doing the spanking? Is mom the only one that's telling off the kids all the time? Where's dad in all that? Why isn't dad sometimes telling off the kids? Why isn't dad sometimes taking the kids into the other room and giving them a smack? Why, isn't dad, why do they fear mom more than dad? Maybe it's because dad's not doing what he should be doing, and that's being a father in the house. It's not just being a father, I have kids, let's pat you on the back for it. No, let's pat you on the back when you're a godly father, when you're striving to be a godly father. That's what ought to be commended. And for those that are not striving for that, on Father's Day, they should be reminded to strive for that. For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. You see, the fathers are involved in the discipline as well, and not just the discipline, because I don't want the interaction with my children just to be always negative. Now, I don't want my children to just think, hey, dad's already around to smack me. I want dad to be around, who also is fun to be around with, who wants to play with me, who does other things, takes me here, takes me there, provides things for me. You know, that's what they want. That's what you want to be thought of from your children as a father. Now, let's go back to where we started, 1 Thessalonians 2. And you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, look at this, as a father doth his children. So notice here, there's three things here that a father does to his children. He exhorts them, right? He teaches them and encourages them, builds them up. Look at this. Comfort. Did you know fathers ought to comfort their children as well? That's probably something you think about that a mother should do. Children, you know, you know crying or whatever. And it's like, oh, go to your mum. No, fathers have to have some compassion on their children as well. You know, some love, some nurture there. Right? So you exhort, you comfort your children. So you can be a source of comfort for your children as well. It shouldn't be only mum. And charged every one of you as a father doth his children. What does that mean? You give them some responsibility. You say, you tell them, hey, this is your purpose in life. This is what you should be doing. That comes from the father as the leader to give the children a charge, just like David did to Solomon at the beginning. Now, why is it so important to be a godly father? Because ultimately the goal is this that ye would walk worthy of God who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. See, we want to be involved. We want to be the leader that God has called us to be, the man that God has called us to be, the father that God has called us to be, because we want to ensure that we raise godly children. And you know what? If you as a man do not rise to that occasion and take on these attributes of a godly father, you are risking your family not walking with God. So you need to set that example. You need to make sure you set the example so that your children grow up, that, that they would walk worthy of God who hath called them unto his kingdom and glory. So be involved in the lives of your children, men. Spend time with them teach them things and you know it's just like your marriage you need to be purposeful about maintaining your marriage it's the same with your children you need to be purposeful about maintaining the relationship with your children and being involved in their lives so you have the most influence on them so just a reminder again five attributes of a godly father your behavior act like a man be faithful be a hard worker be a leader and number five, don't just be a physical father. You need to father your children so they have the best opportunity to be godly when they grow up. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the reminder this morning as we reflect on the sort of father we are. And uh, Lord, I know we all come short. None of us are perfect. But Lord, may we strive for, for the standard that you have us to strive for. 
Lord, give us your grace. We need patience. We need to grow in love. We need to grow in uh, our firmness as fathers and help us, Lord, to grow as leaders. That, Lord, we would always be able to say, I led my family. I was in front. I led the charge so that that's the sort of society and community we build here in our church. We thank you, Lord, for the instruction, uh, the exhortation or the rebuke. And uh, pray, Lord, that we would just take these to heart and, um, Lord, strive for this standard every day in our lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.